My name is Paul Luna, and you're tuned into FMB Lunacy. I am here today with chef, farmer of Gilliard Farms, Matthew Rayford. How's it going? Chef. Chef. Talk to us about Gilliard Farms, its history, where it's located, your role, and your adventure. Awesome. Well, um, we are located in Brunswick, Georgia, and that is between Savannah, Georgia, and Jacksonville, Florida. Um, so we're about, if, if you were to split it, it, we're about 45 minutes from Savannah and about 40 minutes from Jacksonville, Florida. So we're right in the middle. We're in what's called Southeast Georgia and planting zone 9A, which is the hottest planting zone in the state of Georgia without being in Florida. Um, so uh, we're located on Gilliard Farms. The land's been in my family since 1874. I am the sixth generation to be currently on it farming. My children are the seventh to have planted, harvested, and eaten from a crop off of this land. And now there's an eighth generation um, that is also here, not uh, from my children, but from another uh, family member. So now there's eight generations that have planted, harvested, and eaten from a crop off of this land. And uh, Liam started planting when he was about two years old here. So um, he came out with me. I'll tell you a quick little story. My little cousin walks over and he's just pointing. He's like pointing. And I was like, you want to help me plant? And he, he like, he's shaking his head like that. And I was like, okay. I was like, well, I'm going to show you how to do it. And you know, like when you're talking to like a two-year-old, you're not really expecting them to like grasp all of what you're actually doing. You know what I'm saying? You're, you think you're going to have to keep going back and showing, but we were planting strawberries. And I just, I, I had already like top tilled the area. Um, I already had my compost sitting out and I was like, you got to take a little bit of this and put it here and you take the plant out and you put it here and you close it. And I said, do you understand that? And he went, and he literally planted a full row because I told him, I said, you got to stay close to the line. So we had like a little, a piece of string that went out. So it would be a straight row. Those strawberries stayed in that exact same place for three years. And all it did was spread. It went from a row that was about six inches um, to a row that was 18 inches of just those strawberries just growing and doing their thing. And um, it was really interesting because everybody was like, okay, so he's definitely going to be the next green thumb on the farm. There's no way we got to we can let him not be. And every time, uh, every time I see him now, he's uh, five going on six. His first response is like, can I get a strawberry? Like he's still like, he's like, at, no matter what time of year it is, he wants to have some of those strawberries. And I'm like, uh, little cuz of they're, they're, they're not there anymore, but we'll, we'll, we'll get it popping again. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is, this, this is an amazing place to be. We have giant oak trees with Spanish moss hanging off of it. Um, you know, oftentimes, uh, folks, when they think of the low country, so to speak, um, or, or, you know, because we're below sea level, um, they don't really talk about Brunswick, Georgia, per se, but Brunswick is one of the original five ports that George Washington put into place um, as the United States was being built. So um, all the same groups of people that landed in places like New York and Boston and Virginia um, ended up also within these ports also. So we have a very strong Portuguese fishing community that's still here. We still do blessing of the fleet. Um, I actually this year am growing rice. And from what I understand, rice has not been grown on this coast for almost 90 years. And so I'll be the one of the first people to start growing rice again, um, which is this year. So yeah, there's a lot going on here, a lot. Do people come over to the farm to purchase or do you take it somewhere? So we originally, pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic, 
Um, we kind of did a lot of the stuff right here from a little farm stand right here on the farm. And then when the pandemic uh, came around, and we also did farmer's markets also, um, but when the pandemic happened, there was an organization called Way Green Local Fair Market. And um, that's uh, run by a Miss Connie Oliver. And she had also started, you know, figuring out our uh, farmer's market stuff and all that. And when the pandemic happened, she was like, we got to shift. I don't know what we, how we're going to do it, but we got to shift right now. Because we had over 27 farmers that were involved um, in, in, in the farmer's markets and all of that stuff. And we went straight to an online, uh, online format in less than a month and went from one farmer's market once a month um, to now, to date, we have six farmer's markets. We have five farmer's markets. We're covering six counties. Um, and when you think about six counties, that's about 100 plus miles in radius. Um, and we actually, our farmers made $40,000 more than they had the previous year. So we've been able to do some serious pivots um, and kind of like what we were talking about before, like rising tides raise all ships. We all kind of like galvanized and we're like, hey, I know you have this, I have this. Okay, I'm taking carrots to the market. I'm taking eggs to the market. So it's really interesting because most of the farmers do not grow the exact same thing also. So that when we get to the farmer's markets, we're actually selling all of our wares instead of it being like, oh, those eggs are pretty. Oh, but I'm gonna go over here. Oh, those eggs are pretty. Oh, wait, I'm gonna go over here. Those eggs are pretty. So it's like two of two of us that sell eggs. Um, one of us uh, actually sell duck eggs. Um, and that's one of her big sellers. Whereas like my Americana, my uh, Easter eggers are, my, are, are, where, are where I sell my eggs from. So it's a lot of that. And it's been just amazing to watch uh, all of us that are in the farming industry like galvanize and realize that we can't all do the exact same thing. And also, we've also done some really hard work with each other, helping each other, which is um, as important, if not more important. You are also a chef. I am, I am. And we, we actually have a farm kitchen here on the farm um, long, big pine wood table seats, about 12. Um, and we actually have, like, if you, if you came down to the kitchen, which I can't wait for you and your wife to come here and, and spend some time here on the farm. If you came down to the kitchen, you, you would walk in there and go, okay, you have every single piece of equipment in this little farm kitchen that a commercial kitchen would have. You know what I'm saying? We have the robo coop, we have the dehydrators, we have the small fryers, we have, you know, like it's all this stuff. I think the only thing I don't have is like the big giant 50 gallon kettle um, and the big Vulcan or Wolf uh, stove in there. Like we, those are like the only two things, but it's really interesting when I, when I came home, there was no hood system down in that area and I was like, oh, you know what? I should use induction burners. I should use something that doesn't really have any major, that's not giving off any flame. So we started using induction um, maybe about seven years ago. And I've stuck with induction cooking ever since then, just because it doesn't have a flame. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't give off a lot of smoke. You, you, you can like, you, you, you know, when you're cooking, you shouldn't be giving off a lot of smoke anyway. That means it's burnt. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, hey, let me just use these induction burners. So, yeah, I mean, we have uh, three different ways to sous vide here. Um, we have a container. We have a pole. We have a, you know, um, we have an espresso machine, which you might have heard earlier in the background. Like, we have all these little things. It's really interesting because when we do, like, cooking classes and things like that here at the farm, Folks are always like, why do you have all this stuff? And I was like, because this is how we cook. Like when we, we got to make sausages, we need to be able to grind that, you know, grind that meat up when we're, 
we do a raw dog food for um, for a couple of uh, pet owners that we know. So it's like, you know, being able to do things without like, oh, wait, I don't have a blender or I have a blender, but it it's it's like a, a commercial blender. Like if you were to use it like you and I would be using it, Jeff, <laughs> you'd be buying those things like every two weeks, you know. But um, yeah, we've we've been able to do a, a, a lot of different things here. We also do seed saving here. Um, we grow hibiscus here at the farm also. Um, we have a gin that's called a Gullah Geechee gin um, that's made with hibiscus and other botanicals that we grow out here at the farm short of the juniper berries. Chef, what's important, taste or food presentation? Taste. Taste is always, is always it. Now, don't get me wrong. If you hand me something on a garbage top, I'm going to be like, whoa. I mean, like, is this some new fad or something that just came out, you know, garbage top cooking. But um, uh, I, I really find that um, I, I have eaten at some of the most amazing places around the world. And one of the things that I've all, I've realized is that the places that had the best food presentation was like third or fourth on the whole thing, right? It's like, this was scooped. This was just set there. You know, it's, it's you know, it's kind of like the, uh, you know, like the clamshell plates, right? You know, the, those foods actually have been the best because, you know, that is where you see where people have cooked with their heart and let it come through their hands and that it's not, it's, it's all about the flavor from day one. So, I mean, I've, but I've also seen some like amazing looking plates and I was like, oh my God, did someone totally forget the salt, right? <laughs> because this tastes so fresh. I don't want to taste salt, but it tastes so fresh. Like, was it supposed to taste just like this? Or, you know, like it doesn't have any taste. So yeah, for me, I think taste is, is very important. But, you know, it's really interesting because you know, I've, I'm, I've really learned as I've gotten older as a chef that to mimic nature as much as I can. So nature has a lot of beauty in it, but some of those things can't be eaten. And then there are things that have no beauty that we're just like, oh my God, this tastes amazing, right? Like if you saw a Cooney Cooney hog prior to it being a porterhouse pork chop, you'd be like, oh my God, that hog is ugly you know it's a beast you know but then when it's on the plate with the right amount of marbling and uh you know it's been grown correctly um and sustainably like that piece of it's just like oh my god it's the most delicious thing ever so yeah judging a book by its cover is not something that uh that i want to have to do fill in the blank farming is therapeutic it's uh, life-saving because it provides food and sustenance for us. Um, and it's the heart of why we work. Like people work for food, clothing, and shelter. That's the main reason people work. Um, and that's never changed no matter what culture you're in. People work for food, clothing, and shelter. It's always been interesting. No one has ever said clothing, food, shelter. No one said shelter, clothing, food. It's always food, clothing, shelter. So farming is where it all starts. What type of music do you enjoy listening to? Ooh, I'm, I'm that guy that's all over the place. If you listen to my playlist, I can go from, from like your regular rhythm and blues to some hardcore rap to some light hip hop. And the next thing you know, you're like, wait, he's listening to Rag and Bones, man. What is he, you know, where did this blues thing come from? And then the flip to it is I'm trying to learn how to play an acoustic guitar. So, um, yeah, I'm all over the place. I, I, I just like music. I like good music. I like the rhythm of good music. Is there a particular food item you eat that is embarrassing? Embarrassing? Yeah, I, well, I don't know if it would be embarrassing. I guess it would be one of those things like, are you serious? For me, a really good peanut butter and jelly sandwich is amazing, especially if it's on toasted, like toasted bread. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I guess it would be embarrassing. Like, 
you're a chef and you're talking about eating peanut butter and jelly. And I'm like, yeah, but if it's, you know, if it's peanuts from your farm and muscadine jelly, you know what I'm saying? And some bread that I've made, it's, it's amazing. You know what I'm saying? But every now and then I have to go get some Peter Pan, Jiffy something, other kind of peanut butter and just some regular grape jelly. What do you, what do you enjoy doing when you're not working? Reading, reading. I, 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 I love reading. Um, and I love watching movies. I'm like, I, I can I can binge watch movies um, whenever I have the time. Um, but as you can see right behind me, I mean, this is all these books, right? I've read every book that's on this shelf. Um, and this is a small smattering of all the books that I have. And I just, I was just talking to someone, uh, we were just at, some, at a book person's house, like someone that ha owns a bookstore and, um, I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to start putting my books around the house like this. And uh, my wife and I were just like laughing about it because I was literally, we both were looking around like, damn, we do have a lot of books. Like between the two of us, we probably have four or 500 books here. And it's just like, you know, and it's funny because, you know, even my kids go, dad, like, did you like, and I'm like, yeah, since I was your age till now, like I've been collecting books, you know what I'm saying? So, like I have books that are like, and I also collect old books. I love old cookbooks. I, I that I think, and they read the old books actually read more like a story than just like straight recipes. It's more like you know, Chef Luna did blah 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 blah, and that's why this became this, you know. And so, um, yeah, that's that's it. What are the ages of your kids? Um, my youngest is eleven. And my oldest is 35. Um, she just got her doctorate as a nurse practitioner. Do you have any farming secrets that you can share with us? You know, I, I wouldn't necessarily say they're a secret per se. I would say more it's about paying attention to nature um, and paying attention, instead of fighting nature, understand that nature's always trying to heal itself, right? Even, even when the bugs come out, you know, understanding that those bugs are a, are a sign of something being deficient, right? That, the, that whenever you see weeds, weeds show a sign of deficiency in the soil. And I think that oftentimes we automatically think that, ooh, that weed, I got to kill it. But not paying attention to the things that are still completely edible um, and that uh, the old ways are real. And you know, I, I, my running joke is that I grew up with what was called a honey truck. And basically it was a, a water container that had cow patties thrown in it um, and then letting it sit. And then they would spray that on the field like water the field that way. Well, nowadays it's called compost tea and people pay a boat ton of money to either learn how to make it or buy the stuff to make it. And I'm thinking back in the day, it was cow patties and they were making compost tea. And I think that if there was like a true secret, it'd be, it would be paying attention to the old ways because those old ways were sustainable. Those old ways made sure that we still have seed. Those old ways also made sure that our families ate. Um, and I'll tell anyone that's, that's farming that if you are selling all of your wares and then afterwards going to the grocery store, you're not farming for a community. You're just trying to make some money because you should be farming and there should be a part of that farming that's just for you and your family. There should never be a farmer that's hungry, never. They should always have their own little plot and garden that's set up. And I think if that was the, 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 the secrets, it would be paying attention to the old ways and making sure that you eat as well as any of your customers eat. <clears throat> this is one of those off the wall questions. <clears throat> What does playing with yourself mean to you? 
<laughs> okay. Um, you know, I in 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 something that I could probably openly say, um, <laughs> I think it would be when you don't listen to your gut, right? When you don't listen to that internal thing that says, mm, or yeah, go do it. I think you're playing with yourself. Psychologically, you're playing with yourself. Like if you were to listen to your gut, oh, and you know, you always hear that from people, right? I should have listened to my gut. Yeah, you were playing with yourself. <laughs> that, I mean, I, I got close to the region, right? I got close to gut. Yeah, I got close to the region, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Are you a breast or a legs man? Um, I need both. <laughs> Is there anything of importance that you would like to share with us? Yes, um, my new cookbook just came out. It's called Breasts in Yam. Um, and it means in Gullah Geechee, bless and eat. And I am looking forward to sending you a copy of it um, so that you can enjoy it also. The recipes are, are it, the, the cookbook is set up part story, part recipe. Um, and so a lot of it comes from the Gullah Geechee background that I have um, being raised here on the coast, um, my mom's family uh, from, from specifically from here. So um, I have recipes like shrimp Creole that's in there. I have recipes on what's called a blackberry doobie, which is a blackberry dumplings. Um, I have my Nana's sweet potato pie recipe is in there to the to the letter. It's in there. Um, so yeah, I, I would I would want people to like see this book, um, purchase this book, and also like enjoy the stories as much as the recipes um, because there's a lot of history in it too, just about the region and the area and all of that. Chef, do you consider yourself a lunatic? Yes, I am completely off my rocker all the time, all the time. I'm constantly doing things out here that people are like, why would you have five different composting things going on? You got black soldier flies over here. You got red wiggler worms over here. And then over here, you do using fish scraps. What is going on? And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a pure lunatic when it comes to food, um, when it comes to taking care of each other. Yeah, completely off my rocker. 